Building a gaming PC in today's market can be kind of a daunting task, especially for some of you guys on a budget. But for $450, do you even really need a graphics card right now? Let's find out. Hey everybody, welcome back to GTech. And today I'm showing off this awesome $450 gaming PC that I threw together. Now keep in mind that about half of the parts in this system were found on my local used market, so your mileage may vary if you're trying to rebuild this system yourself. At the heart of this system is a Ryzen 5 3400G. Now this CPU has four cores and eight threads, and that sounds like it's a bit on the low end, but think back to a couple years ago when four cores and eight threads was really all you were getting at the high end. But that's not all. This CPU is actually an AP meaning it has a built-in graphics chip, effectively making it double as a graphics card. Now this chip is a little bit hard to come by right now, but I managed to pick up this one for about $120 used on OfferUp. Keeping it nice and cool is an AMD Wraith Prism that I picked up on my local market for about 20 bucks. Now would I recommend that you buy this same CPU cooler for $20 if you could? Not at all. There's plenty of options for maybe $5 to $10 more that are bigger and cool better. But considering I'm just throwing this on a Ryzen 5 APU, this CPU cooler is going to do just fine. Now for RAM, I was going to use this 2x8 gig kit of ADATA XPG memory running at 3000 megahertz, but I bought it on my local used market and I think one of the DIMMs is actually dead. Now I still have yet to confirm that, but when plugged into this system, it was causing the system to boot loop with one of the DIMMs. So instead I bought a brand new 16 gig kit of silicon power Zenith memory running at 3200 megahertz. Now this cost me about 65 bucks but I also bought it brand new. The motherboard I'm super stoked about because I got it as an open box deal at Micro Center. It's an ASRock B450M Pro 4 that I got for just 64 bucks. Now, unfortunately, this motherboard didn't come with an IO shield because it was open box, but that's purely aesthetic and it's not gonna affect our performance at all. Now, I'm super stoked about the storage that we got in this system. It's a 500 gigabyte NVMe SSD from PNY. And the reason that I'm so stoked about it is that I I got it for just $31 brand new. I bought it on GameStop's website and I think it was a pricing error. But just about a week later, a Gen 3 NVMe SSD showed up at my door for just 31 bucks, so I can't complain. Powering this whole system is a 550 watt CX550M from Corsair. Now, unfortunately, it's only semi-modular, but it includes all black cables and it's gonna power this system just fine. I paid about 60 bucks for this power supply, but I got it as part of a local used deal also including a CPU, motherboard, RAM, and graphics card. And considering I've already sold two of those components, I've already made some of that money back. And tying the whole build together is this Gemini M case from Cougar in this awesome black and silver color scheme. But enough talking about the system itself and how it looks, let's actually get this system playing games and see what this 3400G can do. Let's take a look at the synthetic benchmarks, and up first is 3D Mark Firestrike. Pretty respectable results here at just under 4,000 points for the graphics score, yet our physics score soars way ahead of everything else. And the same goes for 3 d Mark Time Spy, a DirectX 12 focus benchmark that also runs at 1440p by default. Unigen Superposition really puts that little Vega 11 graphics chip through its paces, averaging just 19 frames per second at 1080p medium, and dropping 22% moving to high settings, a whopping 55% reduction at 1080p extreme, and not faring much better at 4K. But this chip isn't meant to run the most intense graphics settings at those resolutions, so let's take a look at actual game benchmarks. CSGO is a much more reasonable title for a system like this, staying above 60 FPS on average between the three graphics settings. The frame rate takes a bit of a hit switching to 1080p ultrawide, but still never drops below 60, and only when we jump to 1440p ultrawide do we average about 40 FPS. Now for Dirt Rally, we only stayed at 60 FPS average with the lowest graphics settings at 1080p, but the game is still pretty playable until we get to ultra settings when the system drops below 30 FPS. 1080p ultrawide is still technically playable, albeit at an average below 30 FPS, and I wouldn't even bother with 1440p ultrawide in this title unless you like your games to look like a slideshow. Doom Eternal genuinely surprised me, running at 46 FPS on average at 1080p low settings, and still managed to stay above 30 FPS for all the other graphics presets. Even 1080 ultrawide wasn't terrible, but being that we began dipping below 30 FPS, I didn't bother trying to push this CPU to run at 1440p. Now while I wish I I own Far Cry 6, I'm a bit broke for that, so Far Cry 4 it is. We stayed above 30 FPS up until I tried running very high settings, so stay below that threshold and you'll be fine. 
Grand Theft Auto V, however, managed an impressive 55 FPS at 1080p normal settings, and it wasn't until we got to very high graphics that the frame rate took a noticeable hit. 1080p ultrawide kept us above 40 FPS at both normal and high graphics settings, and 1440p ultrawide kept us closer to 30 FPS. PUBG was really only playable at 1080p very low settings, as we saw up to a 36% drop in frame rate pushing past that. Rainbow Six Siege, however, fared much better, keeping us above 70 FPS with all the graphics presets at 1080p. But this is where we began to hit the performance ceiling. At 1080p ultrawide, the 2GB VRAM limit prevents us from pushing past the high preset. And for a competitive shooter like this, I wouldn't even bother with 1440p. Risk of Rain 2 is an infinite roguelike shooter that I've played way too many hours in, but at 1080p we get some mixed results. Low res shadows are your best bet to keep you above the 40 FPS mark. And lastly is Splitgate, the beautiful love child between Halo and Portal 2. This system was practically born to play games like this, keeping between 66 and 90 FPS on average depending on your graphics settings. So needless to say, this little 3400G is actually a little beast. Now, of course it's not gonna be playing AAA games at 120 FPS 4K ultra settings with ray tracing. It's basically just to get you started into PC gaming with future expansion down the line. Now, personally, I have mixed opinions on this case. There's plenty of pros and cons to weigh, so let's cover those first. I really like the black and silver color scheme, considering that's what I'm using in my personal rig, and the RGB on the front gives the case a nice act it also comes in an all black color scheme if you're not a fan of the silver. As for cable management room, this case honestly really impressed me. Now there aren't any rubber cable grommets which may be a deal breaker to some, but as for actual room behind the motherboard tray, I didn't have any issues getting my cables tucked away nice and neat. As for the cons though, the big killer for this case is that it only comes included with one 120mm case fan. And considering the front panel is pretty closed off, I would have liked to see at least one extra case fans stuck in the front. Personally, I threw three 120mm all-black fans from Arctic in the front because I got them as a five-pack for just $31. These fans are sleek looking, they daisy-chain together, and they don't need any sort of external housing for RGB controls or anything like that. I'm also not a huge fan of the non-removable PCIe brackets in the back. You could very easily break these four out and replace them with some replaceable brackets, but that's just a little bit more work than I think that it's worth. Now, while the RGB in the front looks really cool, for me it was really hard to get it working. Now, I just might be dumb, but I actually had to remove this entire RGB cable from this front LED strip to get it working with the dedicated RGB mode button. I don't know if I just had something hooked up wrong, I don't think I did, but it was just kind of a minor inconvenience for me. And speaking of buttons, I hate the power switch on this thing. It's got a long travel, it's mushy at the bottom, and there's no tactile bump to let you know that you actually turn the system on. Again, that's personal preference, you might not care as much. And lastly, installing and removing the tempered glass side panel is a bit of a chore on this thing. There's this lip that goes all the way around the edge of the case, which makes it really hard for you to get your finger underneath to actually remove the panel. There's just this little cutout down here, which is maybe two centimeters wide. And not only that, the thumb screws themselves have incredibly tiny threads. So it only takes maybe three turns to actually get the thing screwed in. And as someone who's destroyed a tempered glass side panel before, I would not try to install or remove it while your system's sitting straight up like this. So if I had to give this case a rating, I'd probably give it about a C plus for effort. It looks awesome and there's great expandability, but there's just a lot of creature comforts that I'm not a fan of, especially at the $50 price tag that I paid for this thing. Now currently, at the time of filming, this silver model is actually $5 cheaper, meaning I would probably bump it up to a B- minus for $45. And while graphics cards are pretty hard to come by right around now, in the future you can pick up something like a 1650 Super to pair with this 3400G really nicely. Or if you get lucky on your used market, you can get a GTX 970 for about 90 bucks like I did. Both of these cards would be really good pairings for this 3400G. And being that it's on a B450 chipset, you could upgrade to a Ryzen 5000 series CPU down the line. But overall, that's just about gonna do it for now. I really like how this system turned out and I hope it sells fast on my local market as I tend to have more luck selling more budget-oriented systems than my more expensive builds. As always, I'll be including all the links to the parts that you need to build this system in the description below. So if you like this video, you know what to do. And if you wanna see more stuff like this, make sure to get subbed down below because I love making this stuff for you guys. And as always, have a good one.
Honey, I'm a big baby.